Hi, good evening. Welcome to the October 21st regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council. It is now 6.30 p.m. for the record. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. We usually have to start uh, 6.30 or later, can't start earlier. All right, uh, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Haroff? Here. Councilmember Morrison? Here. Councilmember Hilmer? Here. Mayor Chu? Here. Uh, let the record show that Vice Mayor Way is excused. Okay, uh, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Okay, there are no presentations tonight, so the first thing on our agenda is our consent calendar. Do any members of the council or members of the audience have any item they would like to pull for questions or additional discussion? I don't want to pull anything. I just want to mention something. So I just want to say Heather, Heatherwood Park, it's just it's quite impressive. I'm going to read to you what they did. Heatherwood residents have raised funds in the amount of $40,924 to apply to Heatherwood Park improvements and has worked with the Larkspur Community Foundation to donate funds to the city for the new play structure. And I just think it's really special that a community comes together, a neighborhood comes together, wants something fixed, know that we don't have, the city doesn't have the funds, they take it upon themselves to raise, raise what needs to be done to make a beautiful park structure. So I just want to give them a lot of kudos and credit for making that happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no other comments on this item, I'll take a motion for uh, approval of the consent calendar. I move to approve it. Second. Second, motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, next item on our agenda, our, our city manager, Dan Swartz, will provide his uh, oral report. Uh, thank you, Mayor Chu and council members. A uh, few items for you this evening. The uh, First is that I wanted to make the council and the community aware that uh, we have a new concern in particular in public works in our construction zones. And as you know, we've got a lot of construction zones active throughout Larkspur right now, but uh, a lot of our construction zones are in the roadways. And I wanna remind everybody in our community that person on a bicycle, riding the bicycle, is a moving vehicle and needs to respect a construction zone as a moving vehicle. We've had some very ugly incidents lately where construction workers were nearly hurt badly getting out of the way of bicyclists who chose to ride through at speed in a construction zone. They should be getting off their bike and walking it, or they need to act and follow the rules of the road that the vehicles are being asked to follow when they traverse through a construction zone. Uh, it's been a very, we had some very unfortunate uh, incidents recently. Uh, we've taken some measures to, to protect the construction workers and, and try to make it clear to bicyclists that they need to, to probably stop and get off. That's the safest option for them. Um, but this is sometimes sort of the downside of being a bicycle friendly community is sometimes folks forget that they're a vehicle and they're out there and, and we need them to cooperate with us so everybody can be safe. Um, I want to also acknowledge, because uh, Mary Grace Houlihan, our public works director, has told me several times, in a lot of communities, there's a lot of challenges with younger children and teenagers in construction zones. That has not been the case. And we really want to compliment the outreach that our schools have done to remind children about safety in construction zones, because we've had quite a few in proximity to our schools, and want to thank everybody in the community that, the, that that has not been in the case, actually. So while we've had challenges with one group, we've had some excellent behavior from another, so uh, a little on both sides there. Um, exciting news up street, we're getting really close to seeing Perry's open. I get a lot of folks asking me, is that gonna happen soon? And they're getting really, really close. Uh, I want to thank everybody on our staff in planning and building and, and processing and engineering who've worked hard to help them navigate some of the challenges of uh, changing the structure interior, the interior to, to meet their needs and respecting the historical nature of the property. 
Uh, we're also seeing a lot of progress with the other shops uh, now, and so I uh, want to compliment everybody on our staff for working hard to, to get that done. And then I did want to piggyback on Councilmember Morrison's comments about Heatherwood Park to let the whole community know that we have a document, a master parks, uh, I'm sorry, a mini parks master plan, master document that folks can go to that talks about the different things that are needed and have been identified as needs in all our mini parks throughout the community. And anyone in the community who uh, has an affection for a particular mini park, particularly one in their neighborhood, we encourage you to give us a call. It's not always about money. We were very fortunate that in the case of Heatherwood, we had some residents who had the means to contribute money and manpower uh, that they've offered to help do the improvements there. Uh, there are manpower opportunities, volunteer opportunities to do work in our mini parks. Uh, there's volunteer opportunities in Piper Park. And anytime folks want to find out what these plans talk about, what those opportunities are, uh, those documents are on our website. Public Works will help you find them. And I think uh, myself or Ms. Houlihan from uh, Public Works would love to talk to community representatives about what these opportunities are. It happened to be that this year we focused a lot on the Heatherwood Park and on the Dolliver Park. Uh, but you'll see there's a schedule in there and we're going to be working our way throughout the city. Uh, this was a decision the council made to apply monies from the countywide Measure A tax that goes into parks. We take our portion and we're using it to revitalize and repair issues throughout those parks and make them safer and more uh, of an amenity for the communities. Uh, but I do also just want to say uh, this Heatherwood experience has been one of those ones that you, you really need to put a spotlight on and say thank you to a community that uh, wants to make sure that that project's not just done well, but done to be something that they're proud of for the next generation. And, and uh, th I think we're going to get there with their help. They've just, everything we've asked them to give us feedback on or to help us do, they've stepped up and are offering to do that. Um, and kudos to engineering, which worked really hard to secure some grant money to help with that project as well. Uh, so it's a great opportunity. It's a great example of our community and the city staff partnering together and uh, Really, thank yous all around of course um, Hopefully everybody will come out when we get all that work done and we can take a look at it I'll turn it back to you. Mr. Mayor um, Just just to add to that right now uh, I can say that you know Council knows that Redwood High School's baseball team had 60 kids out there uh, redoing and improving the entrance to Piper Park, but we, you know, we are getting youth involved. There, uh, Mary Grace is working right now with two Eagle Scouts for their service project. So uh, there, there's a lot going on, and we have some volunteers not only at the adult level but also at the youth level. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or comments for our city manager? Okay, none tonight. So uh, the next item on our agenda is the open public comment time. If you have something that you'd like to address the council on a matter that is not on our agenda but within our jurisdiction, and I see we have our first speaker. Uh, not yet. Cindy Winter, Green Bray. As you may know, there's a presentation tomorrow evening at 6.15 outside the Board of Supervisors office. Tam will be unveiling a plaque to be put on the new bridge over East Sir Francis Drake. And I have kind of a hunch that since that bridge is in Larkspur, that maybe the city council was asked its opinion and the city council approved. And if that is so, I thank you very much. And I also thank Mayor Chu for telling us about the Marin Women's Hall of Fame nomination. As you know, Dwayne Price took that, and he did a wonderful job of organizing. So it's all the safe routes to schools people, the cyclists, and the pedestrians in Larkspur, all of Marin County, and the whole United States are grateful for your help here because the Safe Routes to Schools National Partnership is writing a letter in support of the nomination to the Hall of Fame. So everything's going very well, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 
anyone else like to address the council on a matter that is not on our agenda tonight? Yes, please. Uh, just step up to the microphone and give your name. Yep. And Sue Carp at 115 Madrone Avenue in Larkspur. Um, one, one concern I have, and I keep reading on our neighborhood thing, is the traffic and how fast cars are going near crosswalks. And every day I cross the, you know, where Perry's is, and cars do not see us coming around the corner. When that restaurant opens, I'm really concerned that people are going to be running back and forth across the street. Have we thought about putting a pedestrian, maybe light or something we could punch to go across there because I know one person was hit there a couple years back and when the light is in a certain, um, through the trees in a certain direction, don't see the people. And so I literally, I have two dogs, I literally have to step out, I go like this <laughs> and they still don't stop and eventually they do. But I'm just afraid somebody's gonna get hit there and especially when that restaurant opens and the juice shop and the coffee shop and all that. So maybe we can consider um, some method of keeping people safe walking across the street there. Okay, okay thank you. Since our public works director is here tonight. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I think we can just assure the public that particular improvement's been identified and uh, we've worked on securing funds to make that improvement. Okay, yeah, that's what I was gonna toss to uh, Mary Grace. So thank you for your comments. Uh, would anyone else like to address the council on a matter that is not on the agenda tonight? Okay. Real quick, um, another thing that's come up is the creek cleanup before winter. And I guess you've probably all heard about it and the neighbors are thinking, of, I don't live on the creek, but I live two doors from it. Um, several neighbors on the creek are thinking of getting together a day, I think. They're going to try to, to clean up the creek. Um, I know in the past, with winters coming, the city has cleaned at least the creek where the park is. And um, according to our emails, it's like the city has no plans to go down in that creek and clear out anything. So that's just another consideration we might want to think about for winter coming along. So if that creek gets backed up, then the water does come over into the houses and down into their basements. So doesn't affect me, but it does affect my neighbors. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. We just have a, a one day as clean up volunteer day or something. Would be good. All right. Well, we have both our city manager and our public works director here tonight, so they've uh, heard that comment. Uh, I only offer for the public, Mr. Mayor, that the public works department's been engaged, is engaged, continues to be engaged in significant work on stormwater runoff clearances as we prepare for potential storm incidents this winter. So um, I, I'm not sure the specific section of creek we're talking about or what emails are being sent in the community. I can only assure you that uh, this is pretty much, I'd say, the number one activity of the maintenance department right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments for the council that are not on our agenda? Okay, uh, I kind of missed an item earlier. I forgot to ask the council members if they wanted to make any comments or reports. So um, would any of the council members want to report out on anything? I do. Okay. I'd like to report that um, the mayor, Corte Madera, uh, Carla Condon, and I have agreed to organize a Twin Cities Village. It's a nonprofit. Um, it's assisting Marin older adults to remain independent in their homes and communities with digni dignity and grace. So we have our first meeting in November. It's just a start of, of like a roundtable discussion, and, and we've got 10 individuals who'd like to volunteer to start this committee, start this village. Mayor Chu and I went to the police council last week, and they held a special study and workshop meeting. Our central uh, Marin Police Authority is a well-run organization, and our police chief, Todd Cusimano, wants it even better. So they did an organization audit, and what we uh, learned, which ne needs some improvement, would be media outreach, code enforcement, a wellness program for the officers, and promote online reporting. So it's just pretty cool that a, an organization that is excellent at what they do wants to even get better. We're in good hands. We also last um, month had a Larkspur Library and Community Center um, public meeting. We have one more in November. We hope you all come and share your thoughts and vision on the building that's gonna be built on Rose Lane Library and Community Center. 
we had the Hall students come to our last public meeting to give their input and desires, and we wrote a thank you note to the principals and teachers, and we got uh, thank yous back. They mentioned that this was a great experience for students. Thank you for reaching out to the school and including student voices in the process. They also said thank you for the opportunity for our leadership students to present and feel comfortable to share their vision, et cetera. It was truly an authentic, re relevant experience for them on many levels. I also mentioned to the principal that if we need anything else from the council to reach out to Mayor Larry Chu and myself, where we are the representatives to the Larkspur Corte Madera School District. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just have one really quick item. Uh, it's probably the epilogue to the city's uh, departure from the Marin Telecommunications Agency. And um, it was confirmed at the last board meeting of the, the MTA that uh, Larkspur will not be uh, required to pay the additional installments to the Community Media Center of Marin, which was part of the Direct Access Providers Agreement. So our exit from uh, the MTA will uh, terminate and there are no further obligations financially. That's great. Okay, so everybody is really here to <coughs> listen in and provide feedback on our business items. It's a workshop r related to short-term rentals of residential properties in Larkspur. So I will turn it over to our city manager, Dan Swartz, and our planning director, Neil Toff, for the uh, staff report. Okay, thank you, Mayor Chu and members of the City Council. Uh, we've scheduled this workshop tonight related to short-term rentals of properties within the residential zoning districts uh, to really allow uh, the Council to get some feed, provide us some feedback with this issue. Um, this is a really growing trend of, of um, vacation rentals in communities. You can see it's very significant in San Francisco um, and it's beginning to affect communities here in Marin. So uh, it, it had been um, something I was considering just bringing to the planning commission as a discussion item. But I think our idea here is to get some feedback from the council before we get too ahead of the issue as staff, um, get a little preliminary feedback on some various directions to go uh, on this issue. Um, again, short-term rentals, uh, these are uh, temporary uh, rentals uh, generally done through internet platforms like A Airbnb and VRBO. Uh, the benefit of these uh, opportunities is they provide homeowners and leaseholders the ability to earn extra income through rental of uh, rooms or residential units for short periods of time. They can also provide additional tourism to support local businesses, as well as providing cities uh, potentially uh, revenues through transit occupancy taxes. Uh, concerns are, of course, transit oc occupancies can impact community character and quality of life for surrounding neighbors due to noise, parking, and other disturbances. Uh, they can affect the, uh, the real residential character of communities. Uh, other areas of concern relate to neighborhood security, uh, reductions in available housing stock, and uh, impact to services. Um, though the Larkspur General Plan and local reg regulations do not specifically address this new trend, it is uh, staff's interpretation that the municipal code uh, does not allow for short-term short uh, transient occupancies. And these are occupancies defined by our code and the finance code by those of 30 days or less. Um, so these are not under our consideration or interpretation permitted in the residential zone. Uh, based on review of these websites, uh, there are several properties, maybe between 30 to 40 on any given day that are advertised for short-term rental uh, within Larkspur. As of the date of this report, staff has received complaints on two sites. One of those has been somewhat self-corrected at this time. Another is um, continues to be uh, engaged. Uh, the, and while staff is engaged with these parties to try to resolve the complaints, we have not pursued what we would call formal code enforcement at this time. Um, 
And as mentioned, this has become a significant issue in other jurisdictions, uh, notably in Marin, uh, Tiburon, Sausalito, and Mill Valley have or, or are currently attempting to address this issue through either prohibition or by adopting new regulations to manage uh, this type of activity. Now, on the state level, uh, Senator McGuire has introduced uh, SB 593. This is a bill to assist local jurisdictions in enforcing regulations related to short-term rental of residential properties by these hosting platforms. Uh, this bill would impose requirements that would enable local jurisdictions to administer programs to allow for transient occupancy of residential properties. Uh, it could allow, um, it could prohibit uh, transient residential hosting platforms from violating any local ordinance, regulation, or law. And it could impose, it could allow a, a municipality to in, impose a finer penalty on the operator of the platform, not just the violator of the, uh, the local property owner. And though this bill has not yet been adopted, there's a great deal of support from city leaders throughout the state, and it's likely to be taken up in the 2016 legislative se session. Uh, we did a t uh, attach a copy for the council's review. Uh, in our staff report, we also noted a concern with um, the impact of housing and second units. Uh, it remains unclear as what the potential long-term effect of short-term rentals would be on the city's uh, housing goals. Uh, small portions of the city's uh, regional housing need requirement will be met through the availability of second units. Uh, we have adopted uh, a program to uh, create a junior second unit program to develop affordable housing opportunities within existing residences. Um, this is seen as an alternative for developing affordable housing within the built community rather than relying on large multi-unit complex development. Additionally, these uh, smaller units are anticipated to provide additional income or assistance for elderly residents who seek to age in place in their existing homes. There is a concern that the potential economic value of the short-term rental program may overwhelm the market for second units and junior second units. Uh, and this could reduce the affordability of uh, units for low-income households. Now, we haven't seen a specific study as to displacement, but it certainly is a, a potential or a concern that the state will, uh, is, state is continually and uh, adjusting housing element law to respond to these types of dynamics. And this is something that may come up in the future uh, as HCD reviews what programs city, uh, cities are implementing to meet its housing goals and what other um, laws or regulations they might have in place that um, work against those goals. So in order to aid this discussion, uh, we invite the council to consider uh, some various options or approaches. These are pretty standard uh, approaches that most other jurisdictions have grappled with. That is whether to simply prohibit uh, this type of activity, uh, whether we enforce this through our existing regulations or actually uh, bolster them somewhat is a, an approach that could be taken, um, defending sort of the residential character of Larkspur. Um, uh, we could consider allowing such uses by right but subject to very specific standards and regulatory oversight, uh, and this would be somewhat of through a business license process and permitting process where they just simply have to meet a, a number of very specific standards. Uh, alternatively, uh, the cities could consider allowing such uses subject to a conditional use permit, whether that would go through a zoning administrator public hearing or a planning commission public hearing. Uh, the issues that generally go hand in hand with uh, introducing regulation to try to manage these types of uses are operational restrictions that can be imposed, uh, things like additional parking, limits on the number of days, limits on the size or type of, of 
home that these can be located in. Uh, also registration and operational agreements or contracts that would have to be formalized in order to allow the use. And then monitoring controls, uh, whether uh, there's regular monitoring or review of permits and then enforcement to assure that the um, operational restrictions are being met. Now, one of the things we did discuss in the report is fiscal impact. If these activities are prohibited, uh, it will be incumbent upon staff in the city to um, uh, continue to enforce based on complaints and the cost associated with enforcement would be limited to fines and court awarded reimbursements if collected through the code enforcement process. If these are permitted through an administrative or a discretionary process, enforcement costs may be offset somewhat through fees for permitting, business license tax, and TOT. Um, but I would like to note um, any type of enforcement typically, whether it's for prohibition or simply managing permits that are, uh, that are granted, typically it's just very hard to recover cost. So they're likely with this new um, paradigm, there are gonna be costs associated for enforcement, uh, whichever way the city decides to go. So in conclusion, we recommend the council discuss the matter and provide direction as to whether to continue to um, or to actively prohibit and enforce violations based on current or amended regulations, or whether to consider new regulations to allow short-term rental of properties within residentially zoned um, areas. Now, if the council were to consider uh, pursuing uh, a regulatory process and permitting procedures, the council may wanna direct the planning commission to conduct a workshop or a series of workshops to elicit further public input, input and conduct more detailed review of these issues. Uh, as noted above, there is current legislation, as, as we noted, regarding SB 593 is being considered. So there could be some benefit to taking a wait and see approach. Certainly, should the city decide to pursue any regulatory process, we'd probably still want to do so after that legislation is adopted because that legislation is gonna really help set the standard or the table for how the city may um, regulate these uses. If the city uh, council elects to take a wait and see approach, however, we do request the council provide direction as to whether staff should actively proceed with enforcement of the current ordinance based on complaints we have at this time. So with that, I'd um, welcome any questions, and I do wanna mention, I wanna thank Ana Camarada for her assistance in doing research on this matter and for helping compile the report. And I think one other thing I'd like to note is, as the council can tell, this is, um, there's a lot of issues uh, in motion. I think every day you see a new article on this. It's pretty interesting how within, these have been around for several years now, but over the last year, we're really seeing a lot of uh, cities and um, a lot of issues coming up. So we're really trying to gauge what is the best approach and should, if we do go towards regulation, uh, what will be the, the, the kind of best practices uh, that are appropriate for a city like Larkspur. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is um, allow the council to ask questions of staff and then uh, we'll have members of the audience uh, make their own comments back to the council and then the council will go back and deliberate on uh, what type of guidance they would like to provide uh, staff in terms of what direction to take. So uh, do any members of the council like to ask questions of staff? Yeah. Just, go yeah. ahead, Steve. Yeah. I, I do. Go ahead. Um, Neil, how old is the Larkspur Municipal Code for short-term rentals? How old's the code? saying that it's prohibited? Well, um, actually, what the way I'd like to clarify this is our code doesn't prescribe, doesn't actively prohibit it. It doesn't really define short-term re rentals, so it doesn't define these and then prohibit them. Uh, there are elements of the code 
that one can interpret and deduce, I think fairly with fairly good defense that they don't, that this type of activity is not a, permitted under the code. Uh, that is, we have a definition in the municipal code of transient rentals. We have a definition of residential use, hotel uses um, for transient rentals. So in the case, what we've generally prescribed to people who've asked this question is if you are renting your house or uh, a unit for uh, more than 30 days at a time, that is not considered a transient rental. So under the code, you know, people, any, anyone can in, who engages in month-to-month -month rental of their property, that is not considered a, that is considered a residential use. Okay, so the code you just described, how old is, when did it get established? Uh, actually, our, our code goes back to about 1962 with a, a lot of continuous amendments that have occurred over time. I was just going to add to what Neil said, that, the, that like many zoning codes, Larkspurs is set up to say, um, these are the things that are permitted, and anything that's not permitted is disallowed. And so what I think Neil is saying is synthesizing several sections of the code, including provisions of the zoning ordinance, you can you can cobble together a, view, uh, um, a basis to to conclude that this use is one that's not specifically authorized, and so under the code, it's it's therefore prohibited. But I think also to to get to your question, it's not a surprise that this particular type of rental is newer than the municipal code. Mm -hmm. I mean, the municipal code does not was written at a time that this kind of thing was not contemplated. Absolutely, the internet didn't yep. exist. Yep. Yeah, just a couple questions real quick and as a follow-up on that. Is there anything unusual about the way in which transient rentals are dealt with in our code relative to the codes applicable in other jurisdictions throughout Marin? Or is it pretty much the same? Well, I think there there are some different, as I understand it, there are some different levels of ho like what the, the TOT may be. Um, but I think it's a pretty standard approach. Yeah, and, and the terms transient occupancy is, is a pretty standard approach um, and you know, from a finance point of view uh, right. for, for taxation. Right. That, well, that's what I assumed. Could, could, you, um, could you maybe give a little more detail on the nature of the complaints that have been generated so far with respect to this issue? Well, we've had one complaint. Uh, I'll, I'll start with one complaint. We had one complaint a little more recently that... Um, we since investigated, followed up with after, uh, and and it wasn't, it was just really observing that somebody within a complex was doing uh, a short term rental and was advertising on an Airbnb. And as we actually got to reviewing that, it had come off Airbnb, and subsequently we found out the property was up for sale. So we didn't continue and got back to the complainant, and they were okay with that, but they were, cons um, again, remained concerned with the um, issue in general. Uh, another complaint that has been um, in a, a local residential neighborhood has drawn a, a lot of attention, and uh, I think you'll probably hear a lot about it tonight, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll wait to hear that you'll, you'll probably get and and it is discussed you actually have some late mail that actually yes. discusses some of the concerns with uh that that look that particular complaint okay well that, that that's fine i'll i'll uh, i'll wait for others to speak on that um could i just then ask one last question in terms of uh in, enforcement alternatives that might be available to the city could you just describe a little bit more clearly what what the options might be you know in terms of sending letters or doing something more draconian? Well, typically what we've really engaged in so far has been verbal discussions and some emails. But if you formalize a code enforcement, you're going to send a notice of violation. You're going to be very detailed, and you're going to give a time limit to stop. Um, and then if the violation continues, you set a hearing for an order to show cause. So you have to you begin doing a lot of uh, sort of uh, documentation 
of the facts and uh, then a notification and then order to show cause, which can be a hearing at, at which time various remedies are prescribed, whether or not it's a uh, legal action or fines or abatement process. So the challenge with this type of activity is it, it it's more of an activity as opposed to something getting built or something very identifiable. Right. Um, that's why in my discussions with other uh, municipalities that have been more engaged with this in the past years and have either regulated or run into a number of uh, complaint issues, it's certainly been really a challenge uh, on that basis. That, um, that, that the, it's, it's the activity you're regulating right. as opposed to a, a business or a, uh, or a particular bit of construction and design. So, right, but yeah. just, just to clarify, like most code enforcement matters, there's a, a lot of discretion that is available to the city yes. in terms of responding from an enforcement perspective based upon the facts and circumstances right. that may right. be relevant to a particular complaint. So, yeah. you know, if it looks like it's something that could be dealt with in an informal way, we have discretion to do that. We don't have to trigger something more onerous. That's correct. If it looks like there are is a resistance to the more informal approach to enforcement, then we have options as a city through the exercise of our administrative discretion to respond appropriately, is that right? That's, that's a very good way to point, put it. I think we, we try to really start with the um, engagement and on a verbal basis, try to do you know, problem solving or find solutions and uh, you know, it, not jump to the formal approach uh, unless, again, as you're meeting resistance, uh, our enforcement programs, we don't have a dedicated enforcement officer, so uh, our enforcement is generally more complaint-based. If something is complaint ba if if we do receive complaints, that's part of our discretion to really um, enforce, focus more on complaints and or, of course, health and safety issues. So that's where we're very aggressive, I guess, as it comes to building and zoning issues. Um, but we we certainly try to work with people before um, writing letters. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have no questions at this time, Mr. Mayor. Okay. One more. One more. Go ahead. You know, I went on the website Airbnb, and it was interesting because it did show around 25. And I recognized some of the homes, but when I also clicked on other homes, they weren't in Larkspur District. It was interesting. They were outside, somewhere even in Mill Valley, listed in Larkspur location. Oh, I didn't, I, sorry, I didn't quite catch that, that yeah, if there was quite, quite no a handful. Valley homes. It was, it was okay. a handful of them. I was surprised okay. to see that. Hmm. Okay. Just want to share that. Yeah, I just had uh, one question related to the staff report, and you brought it up again in your oral presentation. You had tied the short-term rentals to our regional housing needs allocation. And th the whole purpose of that was to provide rental or purchase properties where people in varying thresholds of, of income would be able to afford to either rent or buy a home. So um, can you explain how uh, the short-term rental would create affordability that would meet our RENA requirements? Because it seems like if a person is using this as supplemental income, you're actually making it more affordable to the landlord, not to the renter, and if, as short-term rentals it's transient, not somebody who plans to stay there indefinitely. Well, I hope, I hope that my comments on this haven't been misconstrued, and I think what we're trying to say here is, uh, to, to some degree, depending on how you might, if you do permitting and you do regulation, um, whether it's through a model that's very similar to a second unit or a junior second unit that, uh, that could provide for that form of housing and could be actually part of our arena allocation if those units are being used for uh, air for short-term rentals that would actually that could actually impede our housing goals so I what I'm trying what I was trying to get at and I, I still have yet to find something really definitive uh, in I think in any analysis is the degree to which this growing trend of short-term rentals may impede housing, other than the fact that it clearly, I think on one hand, it is recognized that it can help somebody 
to age in place or it can help supplement an income, but to the degree that it actually um, changes the market value for one for those affordable units, it could actually be a detriment to meeting those housing goals. And um, it, it could also uh, create sort of a, uh, a value for residential properties based more on a, a you know, an added commercial activity as opposed to simply being the residential property that it is. So I, so I hope that um, clarifies what I'm actually saying is a concern. A concern is if we adopt a program, we find we end up having a lot of potential second units or junior second units being used for uh, short-term rentals, that could end up working against the city's need to meet the housing goals in the future, potentially, um, depending on how the state may, you know, begin to um, look at this issue as it goes into the next round of, of regional housing needs analysis. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, just to follow up on that, and, and just a reminder, the, the endorsement of, of second and junior second units is was endorsed by this council when we went through the last housing element. So mm -hmm. um, I, I very much appreciate that clarification because I think it's important for understand those distinctions. Okay, um, no more comments at this time from the council. So I'll open it up to members of the audience who would like to address the council on this matter. And we already have our first taker. Yeah, just please state your name and your address for the record, please. My name is and Steve Habneros. Pull the microphone up, thank you. I live at 369 West Baltimore Avenue here in Larkspur. Um, regarding the, the, what you're, the topic you are just saying about the income of people coming in here and staying, how it'll affect Larkspur. I have, a, I have a lot of people that I know do this short-term stuff, and they charge like two, $300 per night to stay. So it will affect people wanting to come here and live here from month to month wise, because people that are renting the houses out could just have short term making three, four times the amount of money that way. So why rent it to somebody month, month, month? It's just not, doesn't make sense to them that way. So it has a big effect on that. Um, everything that Mr. Toff said regarding to the pros and cons to all this, the pros are, okay, you get a little bit of tourism and you may get a little bit of tax money back, which, how are you going to figure that out anyway? Because you're not going to be able to regulate or know how much a person is really bringing in from their short-term rentals. You're never going to be able to find that out. So the taxes, you're never going to get real money from that. The cons that he mentioned are astronomical to this whole thing. So I would say prohibit this thing right now, since it's already prohibited in, by the laws of saying you've got to have 30-day rentals anyway. Stop this thing right now until you figure it out, really. Because what I'm seeing is, it is changing our neighborhood. It is a bunch of people coming on a very small, crowd, uh, compact neighborhood. And people that come here for two, three days are in the party atmosphere. They come and they go late at nights. They're, they're there for the short term. They have no repercussions as such as somebody that actually lived there for a month. You know, if somebody was carrying on and, and making noise, the neighbors are going to talk to them and there's going to be repercussions. Well, these guys get to do whatever they want to do for three days and they're gone. And then the next group comes in and they're gone. So we're dealing with this. We had a big fire there. Somebody was burning at the rental that's on my street. They were making a big bonfire, huge flames, fire department had to be called in. I mean, it's just crazy. The cons to this outweigh the, the pros to it. The only person that's making out on this is the person that's renting the house. The whole neighborhood loses otherwise, and Larkspur will lose in the long run. Okay, thank you. It seems there might be oh, confusion. Can we get your name? Oh, yes. Uh, Ron Fanilla, 74 Hazel. There seems to be some <clears throat> confusion about lumping all the different types of activities related short-term rentals. <clears throat> For example, you can classify them roughly into th three categories. People who rent out space in their residence and are in the residence during the rentals, where you have somebody that supervises so that the things that you talk about don't occur. Then you have the case where people <laughs> are not in residence and rent out their whole house or uh, <clears throat> another house on the same property. 
And then the third case, which is the one that probably caused the most uh, consideration or consternation in San Francisco, is people who buy up properties just for the purpose of short-term rentals. So you have these, very, these three very different cases, and I don't think you can write a uh, ordinance that covers all those cases in the same manner. I think they have to be addressed as separate issues. <clears throat> I think uh, the only city I'm familiar with that has made a step in this direction is San Jose, and you, you might look at what they've done. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please, step forward. My name is Ed Green. I live at Cape Marin at Latterman Lane. I, I wanted to make a couple of points. One is, is that short-term or transit uh, rental is the same as a hotel. They come for one night or two nights. There is zoning for hotels. They do not belong in residential neighborhoods. The other thing is, is that the arguments made that uh, it's income or it's supplemental income for the people who rent it out. Well, there are lots of ways to generate supplemental income by somebody's house that are illegal, like you can't have an auto shop in a residential district or other things like that. This fits into that category. So I would suggest that we prohibit it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Who's next? My name is Carol Glander. I live at 325 West Baltimore Avenue. I hope you'll bear with me as I read my letter. I'm here to express my strong opposition to a change in the Larkspur R1 zoning laws that would allow short-term rentals at 340 West Baltimore Avenue, Larkspur. Currently, I have had to endure this illegal situation of short-term rentals. My residence is directly across the street at the 325 West Baltimore Avenue, Larkspur, and that residence across the street is completely visible into my dining room, kitchen, and bedrooms. I have resided in my home for 52 years. I am a senior citizen, widowed, and living by myself. My main concern and complaints is for my personal safety. With the flow of strangers coming and going and no knowledge of who these people may be. As a senior citizen living alone, I feel vulnerable to these transient strangers peering into my home and yard. Additionally, complaints exist into parking restriction violation by guests, which are typically done at the east side of the Birkeland's driveway. Also, use of the open fire pit in the black backyard has no su supervision by owners, and the guests may not realize the extreme fire hazard, putting the neighborhood and area in great danger. The Larkspur Fire Department has already responded to a fire hazard call in the pit when renters were there. Our family came to live in Larkspur due to my husband, Ronald Glander, being hired as the Larkspur Building Inspector. We were required to live within a five-mile radius of the Larkspur City Hall. I am familiar with the Larkspur zoning laws on the books, which I'm fairly sure my husband may have helped create as a member of the building department. I feel they are still relevant and service the community well with the forethought to protest residential status for Larkspur citizens. I and my neighbors are hoping that our delightful neighborhood will return to its close-knit family group that have supported each other in so many facets of our life, lives, that we are once again safe respectful, 
quiet and have our peaceful existence as a friendly neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, my name is Jack Undersheim, 29, Escal Lane. Uh, Dan knows me from working with me many years ago on a vision plan on the east side of the Cordobadera. It resulted in the Aegis development there and the uh, uh, store there that uh, has done very well, Paradise First, now a different one, but I think it's still going to do well as well. Uh, I've been pretty active in Cordobadera for many, many years. But now I'm living in Larkspur for a number of years, and so uh, I have an interest in this area, uh, particularly because my business involves tenant screening. I've done that for over 15 years, and I know what landlords feel about ordinances, uh, one way or the other, on uh, rent control and many other issues uh, related to rentals. And uh, I've given you a documentation here of uh, the first thing here is uh, one thing I wrote to my clients related to this issue particularly, and I recommend to my clients that they not allow their tenants to do short-term rentals for a variety of reasons, uh, including the lack of control that they would have and the lack of insurance coverage if something goes wrong, and there's a number of other issues. You can read them. Uh, the second page deals with if you do rent uh, uh, want to have uh, short-term rentals allowed. It gives you a number of uh, points that I think you need to address in your ordinance. Uh, certainly, I think the ordinance needs to start out with a clear definition of short-term rentals, one way or the other, so that everybody uh, can understand what you mean by it. Uh, and I think that from a layperson's perspective, uh, people can think of short-term rentals as a three-month rental. So although you may think of it as something less than a month, that doesn't mean everybody thinks of it that way. And I'm just saying that you need to define in your ordinance what you mean by it. And, uh, and I do think you do need to have an ordinance that relates to this topic because people will do it if there's no ordinance to the contrary. So uh, I think the issue does need to be addressed and I've given you a number of issues here that need to be covered, I think, if you want to do that. Uh, the first issue is one that I think at least one of you mentioned about the idea that uh, the short-term rental shall be at least 30 days. And, uh, and I think that will eliminate a lot of the problems that uh, people, uh, various communities have had related to short-term rentals. Uh, one of the issues that I think people who want to advertise on uh, Craigslist or whatever for these uh, units or Airbnb, whatever, they don't realize that uh, that person that comes, for example, from another country or another state, first of all, they don't know California law. They don't know, certainly, uh, Larkspur laws. Uh, and they may not care. They may not care about violating some laws and getting into trouble or doing things because next tomorrow they may be off to France. You're not going to pursue them in France. So they may not care so much about uh, how they act here. Uh, Another issue is people make the assumption that people that they're renting to are going to be like themselves. And being in a rental business for a long time, I know that's not true. I always get calls from people who have just spent $5,000, $7,000, whatever, on problems related to their tenants because they didn't do a proper screening. And when you don't do a proper screening, you can have property damage, you can have drunkenness, you can have you, you wouldn't believe how many problems you can have if you don't do proper screening. And like it or not, you may think, people may think they can do it, but they really cannot screen temporary rental people. They really can't. So uh, 
you know, my feeling is that you need to uh, have some controls in your ordinance uh, related to this issue, and hopefully you won't get the problems. Uh, as you may or may not know, San Francisco, you're not new in this, you're new in this area, but San Francisco is not. They've had over 500 uh, lodged complaints with the city hall. Uh, of those complaints, they're just overwhelmed. They want people to register. It's a meaningless uh, gesture. I do not recommend that you get involved in that, nor do I recommend that you get involved in the enforcement of this. There's too much paperwork, too long of a process. It won't work. Uh, and that's what they're finding out in San Francisco. A lot of their stuff just doesn't work. Uh, so, you know, my feeling is uh, define it your ordinances in such a way as to avoid these complaints and to avoid these problems, and then you'll have a lot less concern about them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Cindy Winter Greenbray. My concerns reflect somewhat what the former speaker said just now. I support prohibitions on short-term residential rentals, which impose significant costs on a community. Short-term rentals remove long-term vacancies from our local rental market, which is already too tight. A community is more cohesive and peaceful when its residents, including tenants, occupy long-term homes. I live in a condominium. Condo CCNRs include language that can restrict short-term rentals in one way or another, but problems can arise in enforcing the CCNRs, and this can cost the homeowners association money. Because the association must obey local laws, if a law is strong and clear, enforcement of CCNRs might be simplified. An association can sustain other significant costs from short-term rentals. In a recent California appellate ruling in favor of the HOA, I was struck by this point. The expenses the HOA had assumed the short-term renter had been costing them per unit were undervalued. A financial expert's analysis of the actual expenses found a discrepancy that was nearly threefold. By analogy, the city is like one mammoth HOA. Those owners who don't rent their units on a short-term basis may bear an undue burden. I'm wondering whether the city has ever tried to perform a similar financial analysis, and if not, whether it might be an idea to do so. And I'll email you the basic information here. That's all, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Anyone else like to address the council? Yes. Good evening. I'm Richard Cunningham at 346 West Baltimore. Uh, I'm one of those personally affected by a nearby Airbnb rental. Initially, we were confused when strange cars and people began showing up a few doors away, arriving and leaving at odd hours. <clears throat> After we realized there seemed to be rentals going on, we began to ask, so how do we know who's legitimate? Do we call the cops now or wait until they carry the flat screen TV out the door? Um, it's one thing when your neighbor has some family members staying overnight, and it's a vastly different matter when they're renting out the house for one night, three nights, or multiple times in a month. It's very unsettling to have busy transitory activity in the midst of a small, quiet community. Now, this phenomenon is described as the sharing economy. The idea is appealing. Underused resources are shared on the open market, creating a new source of part-time income. That marketing phrase was chosen because it has a nice sound. It's like sharing extra tomatoes from your garden. But here it means that a homeowner is operating a commercial activity that maximizes the number of short-term occupants to whom the house can be rented. It's not charitable sharing. It's treating the home as an asset that is to be monetized. The impact for absentee owners is extra revenue, but the impact on immediate neighbors is greatly expanded intensity of use as several people have said. It's more unfamiliar people, more cars, more noise, more intrusion. 
to the suffering neighbors then, a shared economy just means there's an electronic method for importing a large number of transitory occupants. I'm sure there are homeowners who will tell you they only rent to carefully selected, very responsible short-term occupants, uh, as, as was alluded to, uh, people who take their shoes off before entering the house. Personally, I believe that it's highly unlikely that an absentee owner who's out of town for two or three months can provide meaningful, me meaningful supervision over a stream of renters who are coming and going at irregular times, who are unfamiliar with the neighborhood, its garbage pickups, its parking restrictions. For a moment, I'd like to just put this into a different, larger context. How do we, as a city, decide what to allow in our R1 districts? In past years, not too long ago, we've had R1 homeowners who insist it's okay if they keep multiple chickens, chickens that only cluck in the coop between eight and five. Um, when does the transition from household pets to a commercial farm exist? The chicken farmers argue that raising chickens at home allows them to receive an extra income that they need to maintain their lifestyle. How do we as a city decide if that's okay? Especially when the neighbors complain they never expected their neighborhood to contain chicken farms. The city has several choices. The easiest is to retain a zoning ordinance that simply doesn't allow chickens in an R1 district. That's it. End of problem. Thus, Larkspur currently does not allow short-term rentals. Or you can decide to get into this business. Um, we will allow anyone to raise chickens, but only well-maintained chickens, and we'll appoint official chicken commissioners to oversee the activity, uh, maybe issue conditional use chicken permits. Because without such oversight, all those chickens who are commercially sharing someone's backyard will become a very unwelcome intrusion to the neighborhood. The first choice involves minimal administrative costs, while the other approach requires intensive city oversight and permitting activity. I don't think our city wants a commissioner of short-term rentals. Please don't expand the current R1 zoning to allow commercial short-term occupancy by transient occupants. Doing that would lead us into an unfortunate morass of unhappy neighbors and administrative headaches. Thank you. Thank you. But what about chickens? I'm Tamisha Donnelly. I'm Tamisha Donnelly. Um, I'm trying to find something new that hasn't been addressed yet, so I uh, forgive this if it sounds a little choppy. Um, I am next door to the Airbnb that we are all talking about tonight, and I came upon it very surprisedly um, by a bonfire that was lit at 8 a.m on a Sunday morning on President's Day weekend. Um, I was alerted by the smoke and the fire sirens and the people on Long Bridge running out of their homes, as well as myself and my next door neighbors, trying to find out where the fire was coming from. I look out on my deck, I see flames that, uh, from my point of view, look to be six to 10 feet tall and the fire truck coming. So I'm getting dressed and I'm running down and seeing the neighbors, I'm hearing the fire truck. The fire truck comes uh, since it slopes down to the creek, couldn't see where it was. So the fire truck turns around to try to get it from the other side. So I'm seriously Sunday morning chasing after the fire truck in my bed clothes around the corner 
onto Bridge Street where the entire population of Bridge Street were all standing in the middle of the street going, where's the fire? So I find the firefighter who happens to be in trying to get into the yard across from me and I tell him, it's an Airbnb situation I just found out yesterday and uh, they're at 340 West Baltimore and they are the one who started the fire. So the firefighter came around and went into the house and extinguished the fire. And uh, we were all felt pretty vulnerable. We were surprised. We were very scared. And um, things have kind of escalated from that point. So uh, following that incident, uh, I filed a code enforcement complaint on February the 19th. 2015, and I also filed a citizen complaint form, as did three of my other neighbors concerning that incident and others that we had found that was also going on at the time. My complaint was that 340 West Baltimore was operating a hotel motel business in violation of our R1 zoning laws. I also complained about the illegal parking, the excessive noise, and the light pollution. The garbage cans were left out for weeks, and there was litter all over the driveway. I continued to speak with the building department, which kept telling me that even though the activities seemed to be in violation, they could not enforce them from renting. Meanwhile, Karen Ho kept telling me that everything she was doing was legal and was sanctioned by the city of Larkspur, and she continued to rent her home out as a short-term rental on Airbnb. Within the time that they have been illegally renting their house out, I and the neighborhood have been subjected to, one, strangers. This is a serious neighborhood watch concern. I had my car stolen from my driveway recently. Other neighbors have had break-ins. These guests also know nothing of our neighborhood emergency response system. And we don't know who is who. After we had these break-ins in the neighborhood and my car was stolen, we really tightened up our neighborhood watch, but it's really hard to t have a successful neighborhood watch if you don't know who's supposed to be in the neighborhood. Uh, we have random foot and auto traffic. West Baltimore is a narrow, uh, restricted fire lane road, and it always seems that there are guests that come over to rent the house always entertain additional guests. So it increases traffic on our dead-end street, and it results in the overflow parking, of which Ms. Glander spoke about at the end of her driveway. We have air and noise pollution. Our houses are very old, and they're in very close proximity. I can hear all the loud conversations, and the cigarette smoke enters my home, even if my windows are closed. The guests have no schedule. They're on vacation. Bright lighting is left on even when they leave the house, and even my shades cannot quell it. The fire, the fire pit still exists into the backyard. I feel it's an attractive nuisance, and it's already resulted in a fire call that seriously put our canyon at risk, and um, to this date, I don't know still if it has a screen spark arrestor on it. Parking, there is a constant violation of guest parking. Uh, even when they are not parked uh, illegally, they are taking up precious parking that is needed in our restricted parking zone by the own residents that live here, the service people that we need to have come to work on our homes, and uh, since we are open up to open space, the hiking trails. So they're not available because of the guest parking. And uh, we also have to suffer a devaluation of our property. Contrary to what may be perceived by Ms. Ho, having a rental operation next door negatively impacts property values and sales prospects. As I work to invest to upkeep and enhance my property, my neighbors devalue it. I recently had to undergo a front yard remodel just to accommodate another parking space, something that I had not needed to do in almost the 30 years I lived there. And as a side note, I have been a small business owner in the town of Larkspur for 10 plus years. I have a license that allows me to have a client at my home, eight hours, eight clients a day, one hour, one client an hour. And uh, the parking was considered very much in that for me to get that license. However, I don't see the same thing going on with my neighbor. 
So for the past 10 months, myself and my neighbors have been left to deal with all of these violations and new realities. We've risked our sanity. All the while, the property owners have been absent. They've been collecting hundreds of dollars for their, quote, underutilized financial asset, as I was told by Karen. I feel as if I have been made to suffer and to participate in the owner's financial plan at the cost of my own personal privacy and property. I and my neighbors have spoken to Karen about our concerns, and she has informed us that she will continue to rent. Larkspur has a great respect for her neighborhoods, and it shows in the forethought given to protecting her great spaces. What I feel perhaps the most worrisome of all this is the loss of community. As a longtime member of my Baltimore Canyon community, we have created our wonderful atmosphere through years, and that would be years of respect, both for its inhabitants and its beautiful surroundings. I, along with the other members of my neighborhood, have been involved in various civic projects as volunteers, all helping Larkspur to become the, and to have the ambience that City Hall uses to attract residents and business owners. That beautiful small town atmosphere where you know your neighbors, their families, and shopkeepers. That City Hall may want to jeopardize that special essence allowing short-term rentals is so unfortunate. What may happen and what has happened in many communities that have followed this path is that by opening up our neighborhoods to a parade of guests looking for that very thing that Larkspur is supposed to be will trample her under unknowingly. Larkspur devised our zoning regulations to protect us from this very thing, to protect Larkspur, her image. Otherwise, homes become revenue houses. People will still live in them, but there will be no neighbors. And without them, no real neighborhoods anymore at a time when America needs that sense of community and its benefits profoundly. No short-term rentals. Please save our neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? Yes, please. Mr. Holmes? Oh, sorry. All right, that's all right. No, go ahead. I'm also, I'm Gail Bloom, and I live in Cape Marin on Latterman Lane, and I guess I would like to say something that you haven't heard before. I grew up on a chicken ranch, and my great dilemma was breathing through my mouth or breathing through my nose. Breathing through your nose, you smell the chickens. Breathing through your mouth, you might swallow a fly. Um, there's a lot of issues about sharing or or um, transient housing, I think. I think sharing is really a misnomer um, unless there's no money going back and forth. I used to be, I used to be a crash patter and then people would offer me their housing and I would, sh you know, stay, it. I was a guest and use other people's housing. And towards the end, I started to feel very uncomfortable because I, the neighbors always left me with a sense that I was intruding in their space. And I, the last time I stayed in New York in someone else's place, um, there was a distinct lack of friendliness by the other neighbors. And I became very sensitive to that and I thought, well, I should just stay in a hotel. Um, I think it's pretty obvious if you can, if you look at the competition between short-term use of housing versus long-term use by renters or property buyers, that short-term use is gonna win out every time in terms of ability to compete. And we have housing shortages here in Marin. I've gone to a lot of meetings, and particularly in Larkspur, we're hard-pressed to come up with enough units to satisfy housing demand. And so I think that you can't speak to wanting to solve that and still encourage um, transient housing in the residential neighborhoods. Um, Cape Marin, where I submitted a code enforcement request, um, the CCNRs currently allow for 30-day use of a house. Um, the board is now looking at amending the CCNRs to 
limit it to 60 days and they'll be addressing that very shortly um, because of the problems of liability for us and um, bother to the other neighbors. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, I have an article from the New York Times that specifically addresses property values for home buyers. Um, basically, the summary is, gosh, if you want to sell your house and you have Airbnb next door, um, you're in trouble. And um, the other things that I'd like to add are um, a lot of cities besides San Francisco are looking at uh, Airbnb and its implications. Berlin, for example, a big city, has banned it all together uh, starting the beginning of next year. New York is having quite a bit of difficulty and they are struggling um, to basically ratchet it down and there's tremendous number of articles in the New York Times every day, or not every day, that's an overstatement, but a lot. And I don't think I have anything else to add, except my kids both use Airbnb and have been disappointed half the time. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, well, I, don't know uh, I was going to have Mr. Holmes come up. Oh. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, James Holmes, Larkspur. First of all, please don't call it the sharing economy. It's uh, a uh, commercial transaction arranged through a, uh, uh, a corporate mass media. Uh, an alternative term which I've heard increasingly used in the media is uh, gig economy, which both uh, emphasizes the computer connection and also the fact that it is basically short-term and casual uh, engagement. So I'd recommend uh, gig economy rather than, than shared economy in staff reports and otherwise. Uh, further on that, please don't be uh, swayed by the claims, which appears to be the main claims that the proponents offered, none of whom have been here tonight, but uh, that the rental, is, uh, the extra rental income is necessary to help people make their mortgage payments. Uh, this commercial short-term rentals of this type are simply a financial model. Uh, people use the short-term rental payments to finance a larger uh, house and uh, a more expensive house and uh, heavier payments than they could otherwise afford. Uh, just as a leveraged real estate uh, investor uh, finances uh, his expenses uh, with the rents. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a really a, a purely uh, commercial uh, leveraged uh, model. Uh, further in this connection, I do hope you had a chance to take a look at the, um, the uh, Pacific Sun article of two weeks ago uh, in the uh, October 7th to 13th edition, which uh, says, among other things, uh, the bans that some cities enact are part of the latest moves across the Bay Area to, here's the economic aspect, limit investment companies and property investors from purchasing buildings and using the units solely for short-term rentals. That's the scariest aspect of the, uh, the economic uh, model. Uh, another point which I think sums up a lot of what has been said is uh, Airbnb and similar short-term rentals are consummately a, an urban phenomenon, and Larkspur is definitely a suburban community, a point which bears repeating again and again. Uh, another point that uh, both the council and the citizens uh, may be uh, hesitant about if they embark on regulation would be uh, opening the door to the kind of uh, large-scale, unsavory crush of big money, big uh, uh, business, big pressure lobbying, which apparently seems to address attempts to regulate this type of business, according to reports in the San Francisco Chronicle and other media. And, and that said, uh, I, um, I think that the council uh, ultimately has to either ban it or, or regulate it heavily, expensively, and labor-intensively. Um, 
given the complaints and the potential impact on so many things ranging from community character to our housing element and to uh, our enforcement uh, ability, uh, I think that um, uh, to do nothing uh, while you deliberate on what to do uh, would not be fair. Uh, to, to, uh, to take a laissez-faire attitude would be lazy and unfair. And uh, until you decide what you do, you should enforce the current codes on the in theory that what is not permitted is prohibited uh, in order that the resident seeking quote, quiet enjoyment, unquote, which is a legal term which has a, quite a literal application here, uh, will not be victimized by the side effects of gig economy opportunism. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, anyone who, yes, please. Hi, I'm Karen. I live at 340 West Baltimore. I'm feeling, feeling severely outnumbered because many of these complaints are against our residents. Um, there's nine people here that I've counted um, and four households, I guess, that we have affected. I just wanted to clarify that um, the disturbance that was, that was caused was um, that occurred in February with one of our week-long rentals. And after we returned to town, um, we actually hearing all the complaints immediately came to the city of Larkspur to speak with planning and to check whether or not this truly was an illegal activity. We're not interested in doing anything illegal. Um, and if this is prohibited, then that's fine. We'll accept that and we'll, you know, um, go on with our normal lives. Um, but our situation is that um, we have a four-year-old who's actually in attendance at this meeting. Um, who uh, our, our families are on the East Coast, so we don't get to see them very often. So we go to visit them as often as we can. Our home is unoccupied for two to three months out of the year, which to us is a risk, we feel, um, because vacant homes are targeted often for break-in or theft. Um, and so to us, having renters there that we feel we've appropriately screened um, and are held upheld to the terms and conditions of an organization like Airbnb is actually a security measure for our home because there's people occupying our home. Um, all, of the fam all of the people who, have, who we've rented to have been families with young children. Um, someone suggested, well, perhaps having you know, a house sitter or someone to come by and collect mail. Um, but house sitters, well, to be honest, all the people we know are also young families, so <laughs> I don't know that that would, um, that would you know, reduce noise. But um, by the time someone comes and sees that our home has broke, been broken into, it's already too late. Um, so aside, aside from that, um, I became unemployed in February mm -hmm. or end of January. Um, so it has been extra income for our family, and that has really helped. Um, we've been able to apply the income that we've received from Airbnb to improve our home. So to us, it seems that like that we're able to upkeep our home better. Um, um, I know that it seems like the resident or visitors are unregulated, but I guess in today's internet economy, ratings and reviews. Um, have a lot of importance, and I, I feel like people who use those platforms often are, are concerned about the ratings and reviews that they receive from, um, from I guess, the landlord in this case. Um, Airbnb um, reinforces their self-regulating system, and they have an insurance policy of a million in damage, so, um, so properties are insured against against, I guess, like, for example, someone mentioned drunken behavior or partying or um, things like that. Um, to us, I don't know. I mean, like, we've, we've lived in Larkspur a few years, not as many as the 35 years that some people have been here, and we love the neighborhood. To us, it seems like we're sharing our community with other visitors. Um, strangers don't necessarily 
mean that they're criminals or potential criminals. Um, to us, we've gotten to know some of the families that we rented to, and we found that they're, they have a lot in common with us, and we've shared, been able to share our home and our neighborhood with them. Um, so since February, since that one unfortunate occasion where we did receive all these complaints, um, we did take many steps to actually address these complaints. We um, put together a whole list of house rules and regulations. We put together a whole set of fire safety rules. Um, our fire pit actually was visited by the Larkspur Fire Department um, who reviewed it and said that it was fine um, and that it wasn't going to be endanger our community or the canyon or anything. Um, and so, so we've used it on occasion. We've had people use it responsibly. Um, let's see, so in our rules, we addressed noise, we addressed music, we addressed quiet hours, we addressed parking, fire safety, garbage, smoke, drug use, and illegal activities, and pretty much anything else that we could think of because we really do respect our neighbors and we want to um, responsibly address any concerns that that had been reported to us. Um, so we pre-screened our renters, made sure that every, all our renters were verified and that they had received a rating of four stars or above um, prior to us accepting them as visitors in our home. They're living in our home and with all of our personal belongings. So it's in our best interest to choose the best renters that we can. Because as you can imagine, you know, our life treasures are in our home. Um, so we've specifically stated on our listing that this is not a party home. We live in a very quiet community. Um, we've said explicitly that, that our neighborhood is very peaceful and quiet and that our neighbors are very sensitive to um, loud music and noises. And we've stated in our house rules several times um, to be sensitive of noise. Um, let's see. Uh, we, oh, and then, and prior to leaving um, this past summer, in which case, um, over the summer we were gone for a period of, well, my son and I were gone for a period of six weeks and my husband was gone for four weeks. Um, we provided our neighbors with our phone numbers and our dates of travel and we also provided them with our, um, my husband's assistant's phone number so that if there was any disturbance or any concern, um, our neighbors could call us and nobody called us. I'm sure that they didn't like that, um, that strangers were staying in our home. But again, these were families and these were screened and our homes were, my, our home was left in perfect condition. Um, there were a lot of points against the use of our home as a rental unit, uh, a res rental property, um, but we are primary, I mean, we are, uh, I was gonna say primary um, residents, is that the word? Um, we're, there, we're there as much as we can, um, aside from our visits to see our families, which are so important to us. And so this um, Airbnb just allows a platform for greater flexibility and, um, I don't know, greater, um, it just helps enable, for us, um, a lot easier lifestyle. It enables me to spend more time with my son um, since I'm not working right now. So, um, so I would propose that it be allowed <laughs> um, with perhaps like a transient, transient occupancy tax imposed if required and um, and that, yeah, I would support various workshops that we would participate in and I'm sure many of our neighbors would participate in in, um, in setting up a set of guidelines and rules that can be followed um, and perhaps compromised. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, before, um, I have any repeat speakers. Um, are there, is there anyone who has not spoken yet who would like to address the council? Yes. My name is Sean Donnelly. I live at uh, 342 West Baltimore. Uh, just my two bits, I mean, we've heard some great stuff. I, I'm against 
the short term rental, as you may have guessed. Uh, but uh, for all the for all the reasons that have been brought up, the parking, the, <clears throat> the just in general, the disquieting effect of having strangers next door that you don't know. But uh, one point that was uh, briefly touched on is our, um, I wanted to emphasize, is our neighborhood watch program that we just instituted with the, I, I believe it was with the, uh, the, the aid of Larkspur, where we, uh, the city of Larkspur, where we broke up our neighborhoods into sections <clears throat> in preparation for a, uh, some type of disaster that could occur. And we we had our first meeting back in January, uh, where all the neighbors came and we met and we have captains and and a <clears throat> process and minutes were were developed and such. Uh, and my point is that if we allowed the um, uh, the short term rentals and you had strangers in living in a lot of the houses, uh, it would undermine the entire process. If you had a disaster uh, <clears throat> and there's nobody in the disaster. All the all the people that participated in the disaster process weren't there, or very few of them were there. Uh, it would undermine the entire procedure. So I, I, just, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We had a couple hands in the back. Yeah, just please step forward. Hi, I'm Jeff Berkland, also at 340 West Baltimore. Um, you know, this is the first time I've come to a city hall thing, and I'd just like to say that I've, en I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed hearing my neighbors and their thoughts. I think that's been illuminating. Um, I think it's good to have this kind of conversation. Um, you know, I, I see this as can be relatively iterative and a learning process. Um, I'm, I feel it's a little unfortunate because in some cases we haven't been engaged in a conversation around this. And um, I think that would have been helpful, um, but I'm glad to have it now. Um, I, I'd like to point out like a, a few things. I, th I think there are some implications in some of the statements that I'm not sure I would agree with, and some rather some exaggerations. But just to be clear on a few things, um, the, the car that was stolen was stolen before we ever did any Airbnb. And I think there's been a lot of implications about you know crooks at Air in Airbnb. And I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Um, as Karen pointed out, you know, we don't want crooks in our house. And we have a lot of good, good stuff there. And we think that we're you know, doing a lot to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, that said, again, I think there's some great points. And we don't want to impact your safety. Um, we don't like that. So sorry about that. Um, but I do th see this as a needed dialogue. And I think that's, that's really great. Um, the only other, you know, this is a fairly minor point. I, I'm not sure I get the point about the um, the sales price being impacted by Airbnb. I suppose I might get it if, if it's a full-time Airbnb rental um, home. Um, but on a, as a side rental, um, I don't get that at all. And, you know, we, we did have a neighbor that just recently sold their house, and I'm pretty impressed with the, the price. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure I'm, I agree with that. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There was a hand way in the back, too. Yes, please step forward. Hello, Teresa Rose, Madrone Avenue. Several years ago, at the head of the canyon, there was a sign that said critical fire area. I have not seen that sign in more than five years, maybe ten. I feel that the fire pits in that neighborhood should be manned for all residents because they are just too dangerous. I think that the residents of 340 West Baltimore do not know anything about the Pixley Fire or why half of the canyon has no trees currently. I do understand the added income these rentals would bring to the town with the restaurants, the movie theater, the grocery store, even the laundromat would get more business. Um, but I feel like no business should come to town and expect to do business here without having to pay the tax that applies to that type of business. And this is a transit occupancy tax. And I think that it should be monitored how much they're charging and make sure that they are paying the tax. And if they are not, that they need to be fined. 
the city of Carmel only allows people to rent out their property for a minimum of 30 days. But like the city of Sausalito, I feel that the drawbacks outweigh any benefits and feel that this should be banned outright. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more first time speakers? Okay, council would like to have a discussion as well. So I saw a couple hands where they want to speak again. Yeah, if you'd keep your comments fairly brief, that would be appreciated. Yeah. Very quickly, mystery solved. I came very close to calling the police on several occasions. I live on Madrone, and the noise is so bad at such a late time of night. And it, listening to all this, it's, I, it appears to be an isolated incident that it's one house. But I have to say it was disturbing, and my bedroom faces the creek. And, um, and it seemed like it was all summer long. So, so there is a concern with that property there. Um, and I'm not going to go into the other details of short-term housing at this point. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you all know this anyway, but uh, I would guess that the majority of people that do short-term rentals are fine people and don't create a problem. The problem with doing an ordinance is it has to be for everybody, and that means covering the people that are going to be problems, perhaps. And in my business, I can tell you for a fact that uh, a lot of landlords are not like this nice lady over here. And uh, a lot of them, uh, they may be absentee landlords usually, and not everybody cares who is even in their place. You'd be amazed how many people I, I call up on screenings and I'm doing a check on someone's applying and they don't even know who's living in their place. Those people are not going to be knowing or caring about what those people living in their place are doing that much. And that's, I guess, the point that a lot of these people are making is that uh, without, even if you do allow it, even, uh, 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 you know, having a requirement that the owner or the renter who is doing the uh, short-term rental is living there at the time, I think is necessary. Uh, because if you have an absentee person, or uh, whether it's a company or a person, uh, your problems are going to really be there, and it's going to be like San Francisco. Uh, the other issue is you mentioned about the effect on rentals. Uh, obviously, I have an interest to increase rentals in any given community. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in San Francisco, you're well aware of Proposition F. There's been a ton of advertising for it, $8 million against it. It's kind of unbelievable, $8 million spent on one proposition in one city uh, against about 350000 uh, for it. So it's uh, like a David and Goliath situation there. I think it's likely that a Proposition F will fail uh, because Airbnb is spending so much money against it. Um, there's about 150 people that are using a Airbnb, they have been sent notices by Airbnb to make sure you vote that way. There's only about 200,000 people or so in San Francisco that vote. I think it's very likely that uh, Proposition F is going to fail. But that's, that's that situation. We're a quite different situation here, the urban and versus suburban and all the rest of it. Uh, I just feel that uh, you know, we have to have ordinances that cover situations that might occur to create a problem and will not create a bureaucracy. That's my concern. And I think that uh, San Francisco is famous for creating bureaucracies that don't work. We don't want one here in Larkspur. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, at this point, I'm going to bring it back to the council so we can have some discussion on it. Um, clearly, this is. Uh, not done yet, so they'll, I'm sure there'll be other opportunities to speak on this matter. So um, just to give this discussion a little bit of direction and context, we really have two different paths right now. The existing path is it's already prohibited, do nothing, or it's already prohibited, make it stronger. But the already prohibited is one side of the conversation, the other path that we can take is whether we want to consider short-term rentals. So uh, I'm going to first ask council members if they're interested in pursuing a discussion about allowing short-term rentals. 
Mm -hmm. I do have a question, Mr. Mayor, of uh, staff. Uh, regarding Senate Bill 593, would, would that supersede anything we do here if, if contradictory? Well, it, what, it, what it actually really does is um, enables the, the city. So it depends on what you do, but um, it does enable the city. What, it, what it's really trying to create is a regulation for these platforms that they have to have responsibility for reporting and complying with the law. So um, is that if allowed or if allowed or, allow? or, or if prohibited? see thank you but just, but and, and i guess what i was getting at is if the council seeks to regulate and i, I believe that if the council seeks to regulate it may make more sense to see the final version of the bill because that's going to provide certain oversights or um, reporting abilities that then could be built into probably built into a regulatory framework if that's the direction you choose to go um it does not appear there's anything from state law that that prohibits it and i don't i don't think that the bill would prohibit the or supersede the the city from prohibiting uh short-term rentals is that I, I, that's my understanding of the bill as well thank you kevin you had a question oh well i i just wanted to clarify that point that the state legislation that's being proposed would not supersede actions that we might take as a city correct okay I mean I I have some other comments but I'll defer to others who may want to say things you want to start with your comments uh, I'd be happy to um, uh, first of all I want to appreciate I want to say how much I appreciate how much we all appreciate everybody coming out tonight and expressing their views about this issue this is obviously a very timely issue in light of what's happening in San Francisco, um, which is unfortunate because I was listening to various advertisements on the radio tonight, uh, mostly paid by Airbnb, um, uh, uh, seeking to defeat uh, Prop F. Um, but that's not our problem. Um, our problem is what to do here within our local jurisdiction uh, in order to uh, preserve and enhance the character of our local community. Um, and I personally think this is a no-brainer. <laughs> Um, we have an effective ordinance in place. Um, the kinds of activities that are being described as being proposed are illegal under our current ordinance. And I would be troubled by any strategy that would endorse what is effectively illegal activity. So I don't want to get into the, to, to the merits of this discussion because I think it's all been fairly well vetted by those of you who have done us the favor of attending tonight. Um, I just want to emphasize, though, one point that I brought up earlier and, and others did as well. Um, which is the, the importance of preserving the integrity of our housing stock um, in order to meet our affordable housing goals going forward. I mention that in part because I was uh, uh, in, in San Francisco today and attended a meeting of the Bay Area Council uh, Committee on Housing and Sustainable Development. Um, and for those of you who don't know who the Bay Area Council is, the Bay Area Council is an association of, of companies and individuals and interests that want to promote um, the quality of life uh, as well as uh, um, the, effect, the effectiveness of the business community within the Bay Area. Um, uh, and you might imagine that they would be all in favor of things that are being proposed by what we're considering tonight. In fact, one of the, one of the, uh, the pillars of Bay Area Council's strategy over the next two years is really to uh, to promote the use of second and junior second unions is an important strategy for uh, meeting our local affordable housing goals. Um, that's as I mentioned earlier uh, a, a strategy that I personally have endorsed and want to see more widely adopted throughout our communities uh, in Marin County. Um, and I'm very concerned about um, uh, opportunistic strategies that might undermine our ability to meet our affordable housing goals in a way that is consistent with our community character, which I think second and junior second units accomplish. And I'm very worried that um, short-term uh, rental opportunities 
regardless of what you think of them on the merits from a market perspective, um, do uh, 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 are countervailing against our overall goal to meet the interests of our community uh, to provide affordable housing for people who live here and provide services um, and ha have a history with the community that needs to be respected. So I just want to emphasize that additional kind of policy aspect of it in addition to the all the other things that people have raised uh, tonight. That's an important consideration from my perspective. Thank you. Ann? Sure. Kevin, I agree with you. The respect is very important. I'm actually really surprised. I thought for sure it's going to be a lot more yeses than noes. So I really appreciate you coming out and, and speaking your mind and, and sharing your stories with us. I've done quite a bit of survey myself out in the community, and it's amazing how many people do Airbnb or Nextdoor, even do Nextdoor or um, Flip Key. And I've even asked neighbors who, who um, have, na have the, uh, the neighbors to the Airbnb rentals, and they don't seem to have a problem. So I'm, I'm just, I'm really shocked right now. Um, I, I agree with, we don't want strangers in our neighborhood parking, the noise, all the inconvenience that it can cause. There's also a lot of people that live here, like a young Karen and Jack, who are middle a, a middle income. And I know of many families, many families, that have used Airbnb to rent out a room to help them pay their mortgage or to send their child to college. So I'm, I'm torn, and I, I know that we've got somebody here from the Marin IJ, and I'm sure he's going to write this up and talk about how there's been a lot of more no's. I think, like Jack mentioned, this is a dialogue that needs to continue. We need to hear people. We need to hear more than just the no's, because there's a lot of yeses out there. And um, I even called a council member that is in Tiburon, and they are also in the same dilemma. They actually wanted it banned. Um, the uh, Airbnb, but a lot of communities came out and said, no, don't you dare. So right now they're kind of stuck, and they want to continue listening to what more people have to say. So I'm not ready to make an answer right now or to give an answer. What I am interested in is it has here in one of the recommendations, it says, if the council were to consider allowing short-term rentals, a, a, still a discussion, um, maybe it's right to um, have the council may direct the planning commission to conduct a workshop to elicit further public input and conduct more detailed review of issues related to local land use, neighborhood character, and housing. So I'd like to have this dialogue continued. Thank you. Thank you. Dan? Well, I, I don't... Uh, are there any projections as to when... Uh, SB 593 met, might come into effect? None, none whatsoever? It wouldn't be before It wouldn't be before January 1 of 2017, so it's unlikely it would be. It's unlikely that it would be in effect before January 2017 because it's unlikely to be um, adopted as urgency legislation. So even if it's, if it's adopted next year, it won't go into effect until the following January. Does the city have a, a timeline where you're expecting to implement programs or decide not to uh, change the existing policy? I, I think the, this workshop was your first opportunity to talk to us about that. Uh, staff has become aware of the increasing, uh, increasing use of this vehicle to rent property and, and wanted to the council to give us some general direction on on how you want to approach the community discussion about it including the process of doing so exactly yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I can deal with this uh, comprehensively in one me one meeting mm -hmm. you know just to start I, I'm fully appreciative uh, personally I, I naturally would not want to impact the neighborhoods or with uh, 
unforeseen impacts, for example. So I, I, I want to learn more about what this all uh, means, especially the impact portion, before I uh, start making decisions. And I also want to learn a bit more about the success of programs that, that in Mill Valley, Tiburon, et cetera. I want to hear how those program how those programs work. Uh, first of all, I want to know if there's time for us to do that. It sounds like there is. Uh, I certainly don't want to uh, start, uh, I guess the, the wording was uh, in directing staff to actively enforce. Neil, could you help me with what that language was? I, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to uh, uh, start enforcing this again with with the impacts I don't know what those will be either for example to the, the Berglunds I'm not sure how to address that situation yet either so uh, I just asked the council to offer some suggestions on how we can continue this discussion for at least another meeting Kevin or through the mayor Kevin Mr. Mayor, I could just, yes, just kind of, I just want to elaborate on my comments a few minutes ago. Um, I'm fine with a continuing discussion about different strategies that people might want to consider. Uh, I guess the perspective that I have right now is we need to give some direction to um, staff, at least, in terms of whether any modifications should be made in terms of our current status quo. And we talked a little bit about what their enforcement discretion might be in these matters, and there is discretion in the way in which our city staff can enforce the ordinance, just as there's discretion in the way in which the city staff can enforce our ordinances that prohibit businesses from being conducted. I mean, non, non I mean, businesses of other sorts, like an auto repair shop or something like that. So there, there's plenty of, of discretion built into the mechanisms that are available to our staff to preserve the status quo as it is. If there is a desire in the community to have a discussion about this, I'm all for it, but I am not for a change in the status quo in terms of where we are in our current ordinance now um, and where we uh, should be in terms of the way in which we enforce our ordinances as a general matter. Uh, through the mayor, a question for staff. If council consensus is reflected in council member Harf's remarks, is that adequate direction? Probably not. Um, yes, go ahead. Please, you can reply. Uh, it's it's the city's longstanding practice to do code enforcement across all issues on a complaint-driven basis. We also exercise considerable help me out here prosecutorial discretion uh, in the inf in code enforcement. Uh, frankly, that means we have to weigh the the impact of the community of the code violation against our limited resources to actually do code enforcement. Um, so the status quo in this particular situation is nebulous because uh, we haven't really as a staff made a determination yet as to what our prosecutorial discretion would look like with this particular issue. So I guess I would take Council members Harris direction to I me, mean, we probably have to have some internal discussion about what type of complaints going to trigger what type of action until some future discussion by the community occurs. Uh, I can tell you that I was on Airbnb during the, the discussion just to see where things stand today and we don't have a staff person to spend every day on Airbnb locating all of the violators and just heard about a new site from Councilmember Morrison. I didn't even know about Turnkey or I think Flipkey. Flip key. Hadn't heard of that one. So and next door um, now didn't know about that one either. So um, I'm either getting old and slowing down in my understanding of the internet, or uh, these things just emerge too quickly. <laughs> uh, either way, we can't we can't possibly go to that level of monitoring. So we'll have to stick to complaint driven. Um, you know, probably the thing that makes me most nervous is it wouldn't be the first time when we've sort of had some complaints and had to go start doing some code enforcement and then uh, we get into tit for tat complaining to trigger all sorts of code enforcement activity on the part of the city and I would 
we'll have to have an internal discussion about how we may have to cope with that too. So that's really a, a, a long-winded way of saying we'll, we'll make a decision. It sounds like kind of what the council wants is for staff to make some administrative decisions and then I'm still seeking some direction or Mr. Toff seeking some direction on what future conversations you want us to have facilitated either here or at the Planning Commission. Okay, yeah. Um, the only thing I can say, speaking for myself, I'm unclear on the ability to enforce any policy we might come up with related to this, given what you just described. If we can't keep up with what's going on, how can we be fair with a policy? I think that I think we need to deal with the reality of that possibly first. Um, I guess I'd have to answer that as the federal government, the state government, and the local governments have countless number of laws that go unenforced on a daily basis. Uh, spent a long conversation yesterday on probably the most topical in the state of California, which is the use of marijuana. Uh, there's a lot of prosecutorial discretion going on on the part of law enforcement right now on how to deal with conflicting state, local, and federal law in that area. That's just the way it sort of is. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, this is how we have to cope with, cope with it. What I will tell you is when we do code enforcement, we don't show up with police officers and arrest people and... and Notices go out and people get 30 days to try to resolve the problem and then they get usually another 30 days to work with us on any outstanding issues. Um, so uh, when we do do code enforcement, there's, there's time and, and frankly most people, once they're told they violated a code, they fix the problem. This is a little different because there's income for folks involved and I think Regardless of your direction, the community will ultimately need some conversation to take place. And I think that's what you're seeing occur in Tiburon, what you've seen occur in Sausalito, are these community-wide discussions. And they're not easy discussions. As we know, I think it was in Tiburon, they had one vote, one meeting, it was 3-2 one way, and then the next meeting was 3-2 the other way. I, I have a feeling we could fill this room uh, with a random sample of people in Larkspur and we'd get probably 50-50 on this issue. Um, I'm a little less surprised that the no element was stronger this evening because I think most of the folks here are from one particular neighborhood where there's been significant concern about the activity. Um, although we did use a few channels to broadcast that this workshop was happening, we didn't do the type of outreach we would do if you wanted to facilitate a community-wide discussion. You know, we didn't, we blasted through our own means, but I think if one of your directions is that the Planning Commission should have a real community discussion, that's a, a different type of noticing that we would do. Mr. Mayor, if I could just clarify one thing, because I'm not sure that I've been clear and articulated my own position, and maybe I can do so by reference to the staff report. Um, on page seven of the staff report, you've outlined four options for us to consider. Um, and there's a recommendation um, on page nine, continuing on page 10. Uh, the first option, which is the option that I would encourage the council to promote, is enforce violations rel related to short-term transient occup occupancy of residential properties based upon the current language in the Larkspur Municipal Code. Um, if there is direction from the council as a whole to conduct further proceedings through the planning commission where this dialogue can be continued, which is what you're contemplating at least in your recommendation on page nine, I don't object to that. Um, however, one of the options that is being proposed in your recommendations on the bottom of page nine um, is that if we adopt a wait and see attitude or approach towards uh, SB 593, uh, that the staff requests that the council provide direction as to whether staff should actively proceed with enforcement of the current ordinance based on complaints of short-term rentals. And I would encourage that that be done. Did you have another comment 
you, you started to say something. Um, no, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, here's here's kind of where I am at on this thing. Uh, I, I, I don't want to use a word uh, as strong as a uh, mistake, but I don't want to go down the same path that Tiburon did where they have to uh, re retrace their steps. So um, if there's desire on a part of at least two members of this council to have additional discussion on this matter, you know, I, I want to leave the public dialogue open for that possibility. But where I stand on this particular item in terms of what I would recommend for staff at this time is that I, I don't see this as a technology issue. Technology enables the matching of buyers and sellers effectively to create a more efficient marketplace. But uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's creating an issue for us because of the technology, but it's not a technology issue. I also don't see this as a financial issue. For those people who are using it to maximize their investments or others who are using it to supplement it because they paid more for their home than they could afford and are using it as a means to supplement in that particular scenario, then that's a self-induced hardship. For those who are on fixed incomes or in a situation where they need to create more income, then it's like any other idea to try and generate income for your own household. And with, in, in that degree, it, it's a business. So we, I fundamentally see this as a zoning issue. And the zoning issue is that this is an R1 zone. It is not a permitted use. So to the extent that we have existing codes on the books, um, you know, there are permitted uses for businesses in residential zones. If people feel that there is enough support to change that zoning, then we can continue to have that discussion. So I'm of like mind as council member Haroff on this in that, and, and taking into account the appreciation for what our city manager has stated is that yeah, it's real difficult to enforce all the things that are on the books. We see it every day. We see it every day because I get constant complaints about traffic violations. Well, when you got five police officers on the shift and dozens and dozens of intersections and literally thousands of cars, it's just not possible. But I, I, I kind of want to take a management by exception approach to how we can move forward tonight while we take a wait and see approach or to have further dialogue. Um, the management by exception is unfortunately you kind of have the noise and you knock down the noise. But when there is an actual violation, then, you know, we, we have to be able to respond to it. I think in large part when we see the number of, of rental, short-term rentals that are on the books and seeing literally no complaints about it except for two up to this point, is that we have an exception, and an exception where it has an impact on the surrounding properties and, and the residents. It's no different, say, for example, than any other noise ordinance violation. So whatever the violation has to be, I, I, I believe that that's the way we respond to it rather than to go out on Airbnb every day and look at all the different properties that are there and saying, okay, that's illegal, we gotta go after them or, or whatever the case may be. So I, I think when, again, looking at this from a zoning planning perspective, it, it's interesting that we just had a interesting, uh, a, a community, two community town halls about community character and what it means that makes Larkspur special and um, what small town character means. And we talk about the responses in large part, both by the youth and adults alike, are things like, you know, you live in a quiet neighborhood where everybody knows everyone and, you know, that, um, you know, you know people and you talk to them and, and, you know, all the different things that we heard and there are dozens of things. and. You know, if that type 
of discussion goes into it from the planning commission <laughs> level which is an evaluation of things that we already have in our general plan i think this community will come together and come out with you know the, the right decision for for everyone but clearly uh you know i don't want to look at this and say you know half the council right now would like to have further discussion about it i think legitimately um we we then should have an additional discussion about it but the but there is we need to maintain the current quality of life for those who feel impacted by this because there are clear violations of our code you know 40 decibels after what is it 10 p.m you know can you measure that clearly if um it's keeping people awake you know there's a qualitative aspect on it i think all our police officers have decibel meters or so i've heard so you know whatever it happens to be if it creates a burden i think the burden will be that yeah we have to put more attention to it because we are getting complaints and the other thing is that we can start to create a history of specific properties and at that point you just start to ratchet up you know make a decision administratively okay they're not complying with this they're not renting out to the right people you know maybe we should find them i don't know the answer you know maybe the answer is treat this like a social host ordinance now for those of you who aren't familiar with that it's about underage drinking and if kids have parties in their homes and the property owner is not there the property owner is still responsible for everything that goes on there absentee or not you know so i'm just saying we have a lot of different paths that we can take i think doing nothing is probably a disservice to our our residents now who have legitimate complaints mm -hmm. so can i mm -hmm. so could we do this could we prohibit and actively enforce violations based on current or amended regulations and have have the planning commission involved and have public input until we come to a solution does that make sense well i i think it's pretty clear the general direction of the council is to please enforce the codes as they exist on the books today mm -hmm. so i don't know that so yes first part definitely yes i mean i think the second question to resolve among yourselves is whether you think the community needs at this time to have that discussion. One of Mr. Toff's recommendations would <coughs> might be, I think is sort of, maybe you want to wait, sort of see what the statewide debate is before you decide what's best for Larkspur. Um, <coughs> and listening to the mayor's comments, maybe that is an, a more appropriate approach right now. Um, but we could also facilitate at the planning commission if that's what was desired by the majority of the council. I, I think what I heard the mayor sort of suggesting is let's enforce the code as it exists now and deal with reports of violations. And then if the underlying cause of the violation is, <coughs> is also this short-term rental activity, we'll deal with that as we discover it. Um, and then we'll wait and see sort of how this debate plays out in the broader context. Is that sort of a good sign. I see a lot of heads nodding, so I think I might have that sounds good to me. reasonably close. Um, but if I could just have one second to, to say something, to compliment everybody who attended tonight, but who's particularly from this neighborhood, uh, I think that uh, the planning staff president, I think city attorney myself, we do deal, we do a lot of code enforcement. I don't want to, my earlier comments suggest we're not doing a lot of code enforcement. And I want to tell you, most neighborhood disputes and neighbor disputes are not as cordial as this. And usually neighbors have never spoken to each other about the code violation. They just show up and want the city to, to drop a hammer on folks. So I do applaud everybody who, it's clear this neighborhood's had some communication with each other and with the, the violation they're concerned about. And, and that's to be actually applauded. Uh, this was a tremendously civil discussion for a neighborhood that I, I sense has some underlying frustration. So. Yes, Dan. Uh, I also, I want to echo the, that I really am impressed and uh, appreciate the quality of the comments made this evening. I thought everybody was very thoughtful. Uh, and it was, the reason this is difficult for me is because everybody spoke very clearly and I think considerate 
uh, were considerate with what they were going to say. So, uh, and that includes the, the folks that are in favor as well. So I, I, I think it's, I'm leaning toward, uh, always leaning toward protecting the quality of life in the, in the neighborhood, always. Absolutely. But I think it's worth talking about to see, to make sure we understand this fully. I, I mean, I fully don't understand uh, how the city would deal with it, for example. Right? So the city's interests, the neighborhood interests, those that are in favor of short-term rentals interests. I, I, one meeting's not enough for me to come to grips with it enough, but I'm leaning toward uh, always protecting the quality of life in the neighborhood. So I, I understand that I've lived here for 30 years too, so. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Is this an action item or do no, we just need no, the support? No, we just, uh, I think that's what I was gonna ask uh, staff, whether they have adequate Do you, do you feel you have adequate direction at this point? I was just asking the same question. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, we're not taking a vote tonight. Yeah. But I, and, and I think the, just following up, the direction is um, we'll continue to in, enforce on, under our current on, ordinance standards and take a wait and see on, in terms of the state legislation because I, I guess what I want to make sure I'm clear is it is there any there isn't direction at this time to necessarily bring it back to the planning like elicit a workshop yet at this particular time yeah and I think uh, what we need to make very clear is by taking this wait and see approach it's illegal yeah no, that's, okay so that's that, um, that I'm hearing yeah so okay. um, you know in terms of enforcement I think that's where, you know, you need U.S. staff needs to kind of report back to the council what type, what volume of complaints are you getting? Where do you need the extra resources? You, you know, as, as this starts to um, ratchet up, if that's, you know, as the case may be. I mean, in February, Super Bowl in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. You know, who, who's going to want to, who's, people are going to leave town so they can rent out their place for thousands of dollars a week or something mm -hmm. like that, you know? So, so, all right, so if you feel everything, uh, you're okay, I'd just like to thank members of the audience for coming tonight, and, you know, as the city manager said, it was a good discussion and very cordial and, and respectful, and that's the way we do things in Larkspur, so thank you for coming tonight. Uh, one final thought, Mr. Mayor, I, I think a little humor might be in order. Um, we may have to consider not starting our uh, historic pres uh heritage presentations with the word the words Larkspur began as a, a tiny community of vacation cottages <laughs> <laughs> okay so that was the only item on our business uh, agenda for tonight so I'll take a motion to adjourn I'll make that motion second 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 all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. all right thank you everyone we are now out at 8 43 p.m. for the record